Hey, this is Ryan again with Blue Collar Gaming coming back with another deck tech. And this week we're going to be discussing one of my decks, which is Avacyn Angel of Hope. So this is a mono white death and taxes deck. Um, if you're unfamiliar with what that means, it means that we're going to be destroying everybody else's stuff and we're going to be taxing them and making it harder for them to play their stuff so that we have enough time to get our commander out. And uh, we'll just give her a read real quick. So she is an eight drop commander, five colorless and three white, mono white, um, flying vigilance, and <clears throat> Avacyn and all other permanents you control are indestructible. So once she's on the board, she's pretty much impossible to get rid of unless you have some sort of exile effect or steel effect or minus one, minus one effect. And uh, she's an eight, eight. So three hits with Avacyn will do it if you have to go that route, the commander damage route. Um, but the idea with the deck is to build up a, just control the board for a long time and make it so that people can't do stuff. And then once you land Avacyn, all your stuff's indestructible. So it uh, makes it so that you can wrath without fear of your stuff dying while everybody else is, and then you just start smacking them. Um, forewarning, this deck does tend to make the games go a little long because of all the wraths and because of all the control that goes into making the, everybody's stuff not work the way they intend it to work. So the, the games do go longer. You're not going to make any friends play in this deck. Um, most people don't really like to play against it. Uh, but if you have a cool pay, play group that is okay with it, um, it can be a fun deck to pull out occasionally. Um, it's in my stable of decks that we play at the shop, but it's not one that I pull out all the time uh, because of the reasons that I said before. So my son hates to play against this deck. He'll play against it very infrequently just because he knows he'll never beat it. Uh, his deck is, there's so many cards in this deck that just straight up hose his deck whenever we play it. So he doesn't, he just doesn't like to play against this deck. So anyway, without further ado, we're gonna get into some of the cards that make up this Avacyn build. Um, and anybody that thinks that mono white is a bad com color combo, just try this deck out. I, th I think you'll win some games. I've won plenty of games playing this. Uh, white can be pretty powerful in the right shell. The issue with white is that people tend to just build white weenie attacky style decks that just get trounced pretty hard. But with this control build, uh, I think you can actually do a little bit better. So we're just going to put her up to the side there. I mean, this deck started off as just mono white angel tribal. And then uh, it continued to evolve into the to where it's at now. So... Let's look at the first section of the Death and Taxes archetype, which is Death. So in the deck, we are playing... Hold on, let me grab my notes. Uh, we are playing nine Wrath cards, plus two sort of situational kind of Wraths, and we'll, we'll get into that. So a Wrath is just going to take care of everything that's on the board. The first one that we're playing is End, host end Hostilities. This uh, destroys all creatures and all permanents attached to that creature for five mana. So just gets rid of everything on the board. The, the, where the Wrath turn comes from is going to be Wrath of God. So for four mana, you can destroy all creatures and they can't be regenerated. And <clears throat> then we have Winds of Wrath, which again, destroys all creatures. They can't be uh, regenerated. This... All these cards are just going to get rid of all the creatures that your opponents want to play. We have Day of Judgment. Does the same thing. Destroy all creatures. We have um, <clears throat> Faded Retribution. Again, destroy all creatures. But this one actually has a little caveat on the end there where it says, and Planeswalkers, which can be pretty important. The deck is pretty weak to Planeswalkers because they only... There's no like real good uh, removal spells that I have against just planeswalkers in the deck. So this one does the job. 
a lot of the times uh, you need it if you can't find a way to attack into their various planeswalkers. We have easy ways to get rid of um, artifacts and enchantments and stuff in white, but planeswalkers can sometimes be hard. Um, the thing with Fate of Retribution is if you cast it at sorcery speed, you get a scry too, which can be helpful, or you can cast it instant speed if you have to as well. Playing Planar Cleansing, which destroys all non-land permanents. So this is your Planeswalkers, creatures, artifacts, enchantments, everything. Just get rid of everything off the board. Um, it's another way to deal with those pesky Planeswalkers. We were playing Katar's Wrath. Again, destroy all creatures. They can't be regenerated. And if you have seven or more cards in your graveyard, um, you destroy all of them and put two white spirit tokens onto the battlefield. So just gets you a little extra bonus. And we are playing Acroma's Vengeance. Destroys all artifacts, creatures, and enchantments. If you already have a bunch of uh, uh, wraths on the in your hand or you don't have to worry about creatures for the the people that you're playing against, you can always cycle it away for three mana and draw a different card. And we're playing Austere Command. You get to choose to either destroy all artifacts, destroy all enchantments, destroy all creatures with converted mana cost three or less, or destroy all creatures with command of, uh, converted mana cost four or greater. So this one's flexible, so if there's a bunch of big guys out there and a bunch of pesky artifacts, you can use it you know, that way, or small guys and enchantments, vice or, you know, any way that you want to kind of change that around so the cool thing about all these cards is in the early game if you don't have a good board position you can fire one of these off to help get you closer to your commander and just stay alive right but once you have avacyn in play firing off any of these cards in this stack here will instantly wipe everybody's board but your own unless they have some instant way speed to get rid of avacyn so it ends up being very much one-sided board wrath, board wipes whenever you do this with Avacyn in play. Then we have two kind of more situational uh, wraths here. The first one is Settle the Wreckage. So this one exiles all attacking creatures that a target player controls. So then they put that many lands, basic lands from their library into play. This can be helpful in the off situations that they somehow steal your commander and make all of their things indestructible. So yes, you have to exile your own commander in order to do it, but at least you've gotten rid of their position while uh, getting rid of the indestructible claws on their stuff. So it's kind of like a safety valve for your deck, as well as gets rid of a bunch of uh, problematic things if they have, you know, a Avenger of Zendikar with a bunch of plant tokens attacking you, you can at least get rid of all of them. And then the other one is going to be Elspeth, Sun's Champion. So her minus clause with destroy all creatures of power four or greater um, can be useful in a pinch. Typically what we're going to be using her for, though, is the plus one ability to get the soldier tokens and then create an army and then make all of these big army, you know, three, three, flying indestructible uh soldiers kill with avacyn's ability so that's the the big removal suite that's your all your board wipes in the in the deck so like i said there's nine uh standard ones and then there's two sort of situational ones here so chances are that most of the time you're going to have the board well under control with one of your wraths that you have in the deck Okay, now let's talk about the taxes part of the deck. And these, these are all cards that either uh, stop your opponent from being able to do something or when they try to do something, it's going to cost them more to do it. So it's either cost them more mana or something like that. It's all around just pretty annoying for your opponents. Um, you're going to draw a lot of hate as soon as you start to play some of these cards from some of the players because they do shut down so many different strategies. So the first ones that we have are going to be Graveyard uh, Interaction, and uh, Rest in Peace is probably one of the best Graveyard hate cards out there. 
Um, when it enters the battlefield, you exile all cards from all graveyards. And if a card or a token would be placed into a graveyard from anywhere, you exile instead. It's pretty much what Rest in Peace says is get rid of all graveyards. There are no more graveyards. So anybody playing any sort of recursion or reanimate or anything like that, this card just stops that dead in the water. Um, there's just nothing that they can do to get their graveyards back or even build a new graveyard after this has already hit the field. So it's pretty mean. A lot of people hate that card. And if you need, if you don't have rest in peace and you need some other way to get rid of a graveyard, we're playing Angel of Finality. So Angel of Finality is a four drop angel. It's three, four. When it enters the battlefield, you exile all cards from target player's graveyard. So mostly you're just going to target the guy that's doing the, the graveyard reanimator shenanigans or the uh, flashback or rebound, anything like that. That's got a bunch of stuff in their graveyards that they're going to want to recur later. You can just get rid of it with Angel of Finality. And then it leaves behind a 3-4 body that you can use to kill them later with once you've got Avacyn online. Another hoser for graveyard strategies or reanimator strategies that's sort of subtle that you might not necessarily think all the time is going to be Containment Priest. So it has it's a 2-2 two, two for 2. It's uh, It has Flash, and if a non-token creature would enter the battlefield and it wasn't cast you're going to exile it instead. So as soon as they put that, you know, any creature in their graveyard and then go for that reanimate, you just flash out Containment Priest and say, no, no, and then it gets exiled instead. So they took all that time to set up, and uh, unfortunately, all their stuff is going to be gone. They're going for that sneak attack. They press, you know, one red. They go, I'm going to sneak attack, and you flash in Containment Priest. Yep, nope. This hose is the new uh, Perforos pretty good. <laughs> All right, then we have a couple of, a couple more creatures here that stop all of those annoying ETB decks. So that's your Yarix, that's your Gontis, that's all those types of decks in Hushbringer. So it's a two mana, one, two flyer lifelink, and it says creatures in the battlefield don't uh, cause abilities to trigger. So. Yarrick just gets completely stopped once you have a Hushbringer online. Um, I mean, because most of their removal and most of their answers are going to be in the form of ETB effects, it just completely stops all that. And then we also have Hushwing Griff, does the exact same thing, except it costs three, and it has, it's a 2-1 instead of a 1-2, and it has Flash. So you can sneak this one in on somebody, whereas Hushbringer, they, they see it coming every time. <clears throat> now we're going to, so those are your stop ETBs, these are your stop graveyard. We have a couple of cards that stop searching, so you can't search libraries. So we have uh, Leon and Arbiter. So it's a two mana, two, two, and it says players can't search libraries. And then any player may pay two for that player to ignore this effect until the end of turn. So all of your fetch lands get turned off. All of your... Uh, tutors get turned off. Uh, anything like that that help, that lets people search libraries, they're going to have to pay two to enable that or they just don't get to do it at all. The other one that goes along with Lean and Arbiter is Aven Mind Sensor. So it's a 2-1 uh, for three. It has flash and flying. But really what we care about is if an opponent would search their library, uh, they search the top four cards instead. So they crack that that fetch land, you flash in Aven Mind Sensor, and they say, oh, look through the top four, see if you find something. And if they don't, then they just crack the fetch for nothing. If they search, you know, Demonic Tutor up something, Aven Mind Sensor says, well, you just get to get something from the top four instead of what you're really looking for. So these are some good hoser cards for all those uh, searches through the libraries. And we don't really do that in this deck, so it doesn't really matter to us. There are a few, Hushwing Griff has... Hushbringer do turn off a few of our cards, like Angel of Finality, um, but not enough that it's going to hurt us worse than it's going to hurt our opponents, usually. Now we have a couple of cards here that make it so that it's hard for aggressive decks to survive in Blind Obedience. I'm actually going to move this over here so it's out of the, the glare there. So Blind Obedience is a two-mana enchantment 
that says artifacts and creatures your opponent control enter the battlefield tapped. So very good against, you know, heavy ramp strategies, very good against aggressive creature strategies. And it also has extort. So all of your spells, now you can pay an extra white whenever you cast them to have all of your opponents lose a life and you gain a life uh, for um, each one that lost that much. So it's usually three. Um, that's helpful to help you stay in the game longer. They can't aggro you out. They can't, uh, the, your life gain, uh, the incidental life gain actually helps get you, keep you alive longer till the end of the game. Um, and another one that's very much like that is going to be Thalia. Uh, not two mana Thalia. We're playing three mana Thalia. And it is a three mana, three two with first strike. But really, the important part is creatures in non basic lands your opponent's control enter the battlefield tapped. So again, slowing down your opponent's creatures, slowing down their mana base, either with artifact tapping or non-basic land tapping. It just keeps them uh, off of what they need to be doing um, that much more so that you can actually d develop your strategy out. I'm actually going to move Avacyn just out of frame here. <clears throat> the next one is the taxes part that we were talking about. So... The first one that we have is going to be Aura of Silence. It's a three-mana enchantment. It says, Artifact and Enchantment spells your opponent's cast cost two more generic to cast. And then you can sacrifice Aura of Silence to destroy a target artifact or enchantment. So this card is just a beater because even if they pay the extra two to get their really good artifact out or enchantment out that they needed to win, you can always just sacrifice it away to just get rid of it. Um, it definitely prevents fast artifact ramp from happening from your opponents and it it uh, discourages them from playing um things on the board and the the, the three mana cost of aura of silence is going to be important later when we show some of our um creatures that are going to help us out here uh but having it be th only three mana to to do this effect is pretty important and since it's a permanent uh you'll see we have a uh, sun titan coming up here the next one is Spell Tithe Enforcer. So this is a five mana creature. It's a three, three. But what we like about it is whenever an opponent plays a spell, that player sacrifices a permanent unless he or she pays one generic mana. So it pretty much just makes all their spells cost one more. Most people aren't willing to sacrifice permanents away um, unless they're playing like a bunch of tokens or things that they actually like a sacrifice deck. I mean, that could backfire on you, but for the most part, everybody just wants to get their stuff out and just they're willing to pay the one to do it. <clears throat> and then the last tax card is Chancellor of the Annex. It's a seven mana uh, angel. Um, it's, it's a five, six with flying and it has the static ability. Whenever an opponent casts a spell, counter it unless that player pays one. So same thing with Spell Tithe Enforcer, except it doesn't um, allow them to sacrifice. It counters it. But it has a, another clause that if you reveal it during your opening hand, um, each opponent casts his or her first spell of the game, that clause happens. So their very first spells of the game all cost one more. They get countered. So that turn one soul ring turns into a turn ring, turn two, two mana soul ring. Um, so it just, again slows the game down, helps you build your board a little bit faster so that you can get to Avacyn and do your uh, what you're trying to do. Now we have a couple, a few more cards here that are just kind of in different uh, hoser strategies, but they help us. So <clears throat> we're playing Spirit of the Labyrinth. It's a two mana, three, one enchantment creature. And it says each player can't draw more than one card each turn. So in this mono-white deck, we have kind of an issue with... White typically has an issue with card draw. Um, when you play a card like Spirit of the Labyrinth, you equalize the playing field. So those green and blue decks and black decks that are drawing all these cards, well, you just tell them, nope, you're only drawing one card just like me. So it, it stops everybody from doing those types of things. Uh, we're playing Grand Abolisher. And what Grand Abolisher says is during your turn, your opponents can't cast spells or activate abilities of artifacts, creatures, or enchantments. So Grand Abolisher says pretty much your spells become uncounterable on your turn. So your Avacyn, if you have a Grand Abolisher out and you want to cast your Avacyn, 
you're safe from uh, getting that countered. So it just protects you on your turn from casting spells and activating abilities. We're playing... I'm going to move that. Angel of Jubilation. So this is a 4-mana 3-3 three, three flyer. Um, it says... Uh, other non-black creatures you control get plus one, plus one. So that's all of our creatures since they're all white. So all of our creatures get plus one, plus one. So it's an anthem effect. And then the important part is that players can't pay life or sacrifice creatures to cast spells or activate abilities. So for all those black players out there playing Erebos where they get to pay two life or greed or pay two life and some mana and draw a card, can't do it because you can't pay life. Uh, Toxic Deluge gets shut off. Um, you can't sacrifice a creature um, to uh, Viscera Seers or anything like that. So it's definitely very much angled against black players. Um, but there are some life pay and sacrifice effects in some of the other red and blue decks out there. So uh, you, you never know. You just Sometimes this card just inadvertently just turns off a strategy that you weren't even expecting. And then the last card in our taxes category is going to be glared out because it's a freaking foil. Uh, so hopefully we can read that. It's Angel of Archangel of Tithes. So again, it's a four mana, three, five flyer this time. So it has five tough. It's got that big butt. And... Uh, it says, as long as Archangel Tithe is untapped, creatures can't attack you or planeswalkers you control unless their controller pays one for each of those creatures. So it creates like a little mini propaganda for you. And if it's attacking, then creatures can't block unless they pay one uh, for all the creatures that are attacking. So once you... they People don't usually want to attack you once you play this out because they don't want to waste their mana on their turn. And then once you're attacking them then they don't want to uh, keep mana up, so you can usually attack pretty freely into them. So it, it's just in the early game when you're trying to build up, it's very good defensively. In the late game when you're trying to start attacking and winning the game, it's good because then they don't want to keep their mana up to prevent blocks. So it just helps. And the fact that it's a 3-5 flyer doesn't hurt either. A lot of these have a lot of white pips, so your devotion to white gets pretty high. Um, so that's also an important thing to think about in this deck since we do play things like Nykthos and Heliod, which we're going to talk about later. Okay, so that is all of the tax creatures. Again, none of these things are going to make you friends. Everybody's going to be coming after you as soon as you play some of these cards. I mean, these, these things are not, you know, fun for the table typically. Uh, so be aware that when you drop these to have... Uh, a plan because the, the table's going to turn on you. All right. So we got Avacyn. And she's a pretty ridiculously powerful card. So everybody is going to be after her in some way or another, either through exile effects, through steel effects, through, uh, the, you know, minus effects, whatever it is, there's got to be, they have to get rid of her. Otherwise, you know, She's just going to take over the game if it's bouncing it with Cyclonic Rift or whatever. So we have to have ways to protect our commander once we have her in play. So oftentimes you might play her a little bit off curve if you need a way to do this. Or you set up early and then you have the, the, the items in place ready to go for when you do drop her. So some of the early things that we can play in order to help protect Avacyn are going to be Mother of Runes. So it's a one mana, one, one. And all it says is tap, target creature you control gains protection of the call of your choice until end of turn. So if they have that Cyclonic Rift not overloaded or if they have a um, Mind Control or if they have a um, Utter End or something like that, you just tap this, say, hey, uh, protection from blue or black or white or whatever, and now that spell fizzles. Mother of Runes is pretty cool because she can actually uh, target herself as well. So that's something to keep in mind. So if they go after, you can always block with Mother of Runes and tap and give protection against the color that the creature that you're blocking is. Another one, new one is Giver of Runes. 
much like Mother of Runes, except it says another. Um, and you can actually choose colorless with Giver of Runes. That's another difference between Mother. Mother only provides uh, a color, whereas Giver you can do colorless also. So it's it, it has a little bit more uh, toughness too, so it's got two toughness, so it can block some one ones if you have to. But two ways to tap, uh, give your commander protection from whatever color or colorless or whatever that you need to do. Another way that we're going to do it is that glare is right there in the middle of the camera. I'm sorry, guys. Is Lightning Greaves. So Lightning Greaves is a two-mana artifact and with an equipped cost of zero that says equipped creature has haste and shroud. So as soon as you cast Avacyn out, you can suit up the Lightning Greaves right onto her and start attacking, and then nobody can interact with her once that happens. I mean, that oftentimes, unless you have a mass... Uh, board bounce like cyclonic rift or a mass board wipe like uh toxic dailers there's sometimes there's no way to get rid of her at that point once this happens so it's a pretty helpful little card another card that we're playing is teferi's protection so it says and it's a three mana instant um if you don't know what it does it says until your next turn your life total can't change and you have protection from everything all permanents you control phase out and what phasing out means that they all go away, and at the beginning of the next upkeep, they all phase back in, and they come back into play. And then you have to uh, exile to Fairy's Protection when you cast it. So somebody's going for that Cyclonic Rift. You cast to Fairy's Protection. All of your stuff phases out. Everybody else's stuff gets bounced back to their hand, except you and the player that cast it. Then at the beginning of your turn, all your stuff comes back in, and you just resume killing everybody. <laughs> so very good card in this deck uh, whenever you need that protection. And then one last card that we're playing is Homeward Path. It's it's a land, and I'm, I'm playing, I'm showing you some of the lands in the different categories this time, as opposed to the last time where I just showed all the lands at the end, um, because they, they, they work for the different categories that we're working in. Um, and Homeward Path, that lets you add one generic, but it has tap. Each player gains control of all creatures he or she owns. So if somebody does go for that mind control effect and steals Avacyn from you, you can just homeward path it back and you get it back on your side of the, the board. There are, you know, definitely cards out there, Memnark and other things that can uh, steal your stuff away, but homeward path will ensure that you have the way to get them back. So that's it for our protection suite of Avacyn. We only have five cards that we're using to protect her. She, because she's so resilient on her own, we only need a couple of things to help make uh, shore up some of the, the weaknesses that she has, which is uh, what we've talked about. So <clears throat> we have a couple of card draw. So we had um, Spirit of the Labyrinth, which made it so that, you know, the other players couldn't draw cards. But um, if we don't have Spirit out and we need to draw some cards, we have a couple ways to do that. First one's going to be with Mind's Dilation, which is a five-mana artifact that says whenever an opponent draws a card, you can pay one. If you do, draw a card. So this is a great mana sink for us because if you have open mana, you can just leave three open, let it go around the board. Everybody's going to get a draw step. You can pay one at everybody's turn and draw three cards. So if you need that late-game card draw, Mind's Eye is, the, is going to be really good for you. Then if you have a player that likes to play a bunch of cards being drawn at one time. They play, uh, I don't know, Mold Drifter, Blue Sun Zenith, whatever. They, they pay a big card draw spell. You can always flash in Alms Collector, which is a 4-mana 3-4 uh, creature with flash. And it says, if an opponent would draw two or more cards, instead you and that player each draw a card. So they, um, they don't get their big card draw uh and you guys just both get to draw a card so it helps control them from drawing too many cards and it helps you get more cards in your hand and it gives a body that you can then attack with later because it's going to be indestructible with avison so it just provides some incidental card draw um, with the alms collector and then as i said before i'm showing you some lands uh so we're playing arch of Verasco, and it has a send so if you have 10 or more permanents then you have the city's blessing. 
and it taps to add one colorless, and you can pay five and tap it to draw a card, and you can only activate that if you have the City's Blessing. This is a desperation card draw spell because it costs six mana to draw a card, but in this deck, there's really no um, downside to running this card because we're playing Mono White, and we have a lot of open slots for um, utility cards, and card draw tends to be something that you're going to want to want. And this deck also ramps ridiculously hard, which is what we're going to talk about here in a little bit. Um, so you te tend to have a lot of open mana lying around. You have to ramp out pretty hard because when your commander costs eight and it's the linchpin of your whole deck, you need a way to get there quick. And the last card that we're playing is Cryptic Caves. It taps for one colorless and you can pay one, tap and sack. Uh, you can draw a card. And you can only activate that if you have five or more lands, which isn't usually a problem because when you're trying to do this, you're going to have enough mana because you're probably already at the point where you have eight mana. Um, so just two lands that are just going to help you out get some more card draw plus a couple of guys. We also have uh, three cards in our ramp category that are going to help us draw cards in the late game when we don't need the ramp anymore. But we will talk about those when we get there. So technically seven card draw spells, but I didn't want to uh, cross cards over into different groups. Um, so let's talk about that ramp. So we have um, a lot of different ramp cards. So we have 13 traditional ramp spells that you would, when you play them, you actually increase the amount of mana that you have available on the board from when you did when you cast the spell. So the first one is the one that everybody knows is Soul Ring. Pay one, you get two. Uh, we're playing Everflowing Chalice. So it's a zero dropped uh, artifact with multi-kicker two. And then it gets, you put a counter on it for each time you kicked it. And then it gives you one mana for each charge counter on over Everflowing Chalice. So for two mana, you get one mana on the ever flowing for four mana you get two for six mana you get three so it scales up well with the game because you can play this late game and have it tap for three or four mana you can play it on turn one if you play a soul ring you can play it on turn two if you don't and have just one extra mana available to get you closer to that avacyn that you need we're playing marble diamond which it's a two mana artifact that comes into play tapped and you can tap to add one white to your mana pool we're playing Cold Steel Heart, does pretty much the same thing, comes in the battlefield tap for two mana, and it's an energy, choose a color, and you tap it to add one mana of the chosen color, so it's pretty much another copy of Marble Diamond. Um, we're paying, playing Felwar Stone, so you can tap to add one mana of any color that a land an opponent could produce. Um, so it doesn't really matter, most of the time it's colorless um, if they're not playing any white. But if somebody happens to be playing white, then you have another two mana white source that you can you can use there we're playing mindstone it's two mana tap add a colorless or you can pay one to sacrifice it and draw a card so this is one of the cards that i was talking about in the card draw category that you can uh utilize late game to draw some cards to get some advantage once you don't need the mana anymore and we're playing heraldic banner so for three mana you get to choose a color uh, creatures of the chosen color get plus one plus zero so we're always going to choose white so all of our guys just get just a little bit bigger and you can tap to add one mana of the chosen color so it's going to be white so uh, it adds a little bit of benefit playing worn power stone three mana artifact again when it enters the battlefield it enters tapped and you can tap it to add two mana to your mana pool it's poor man soul ring but in this deck we need the ramp so we're going to do it playing basalt monolith so it's three mana artifact. Um, it doesn't untap during your untap step, but you can tap it to add three mana to your mana pool. So you can play Basalt Monolith, and then when you're ready to go for that big Avacyn turn, you can tap it, get your eight mana commander out, and then later down the road in the game, you can untap it if you need to, um, if you don't have anything else to do. So it'll help you uh, get some more value later. We're playing Hedron Archive. So this is a four mana artifact that taps to add two to your mana pool and then cards. So it's a double mind stone. So instead of adding one, it adds two. And instead of drawing one, 
for one mana, it, you pay two and you can draw two. So this was also in that card draw category that we were talking about. So late game, if you don't need Hedron Archive, you can get rid of it, draw some cards. We're playing Gilded Lotus. So Gilded Lotus is a five mana artifact that taps to add three mana of any one color to your mana pool. So we're always gonna be using this for white. So five mana, tap, get three white. And then we actually have two ramp cards that get you lands directly to the battlefield. So all these other ones over here have all been artifact ramp. So if there's some way that they can get rid of artifacts before you have Avacyn out, that's going to slow down your, your plan as far as uh, ramping out your commander. But we do have two cards that help you get the lands directly into play. First one is Solemn Simulacrum. Uh, when Solemn enters the battlefield, you search your library for a basic land and put that card onto the battlefield tapped. So get you a basic planes onto the battlefield tapped. And then when he dies, you get a draw card. So he goes in both the ramp and the card draw category. And he just leaves a random dude around that you might be able to hit somebody with. And then the other one that we're playing is uh, Knight of the White Orchid. It's a two mana 2-2 two -two with first strike. And when it enters the battlefield, if an opponent controls more lands than you, you may search your library for a planes card and put that onto the battlefield and then shuffle your library. Notice it doesn't say tapped, so you can play this on turn two, get a planes and hold one mana open or play like a mother of runes or something like that. So that gets it into the battlefield untapped. The only caveat is somebody has to have more lands. So typically when you play Avacyn, you don't want to play first. That's a pro tip uh, because you want other people to have one more land in play than you. Uh, because on turn two, if you're playing first, you're going to be the first one to have two lands more than likely. Um, so definitely with this deck, you want to play, you don't want to play first. Um, it, it sounds counterintuitive, but it, that's just the way it works in this one because there's a lot of these effects that it, if you don't have more lands, then you can get more lands um, in white because they, they want you to kind of play from behind. Okay, so those are our 13 straight up ramp cards. So there's and there if you notice most of them are they don't cost very much most of them are three and under a lot of them are at the two mana slot um because we need to get moving quickly in order to get our commander online uh the next group are going to be cards that um don't necessarily ramp you but they give you card they they're like pseudo card draw but the card draw is always land so it gets you lands to hands, um, which is very important when you're trying to continue to make your land drops to get up to eight mana. So the first one is uh, Oresco's Explorer. When it enters the battlefield, search your library for up to X planes cards, where X is the number of players who control more lands than you. Reveal those cards, put them in your hand, then shuffle your library. Again, you want to play, you don't want to play first. You want, if you play this on turn two and you played last and all three of your opponents have more lands than you, then you're going to be able to go and grab three planes and stick them in your hand and then you'll have your land drops um, for the next three turns, guaranteed. Another one that we're playing is Weathered Wayfair. Um, again, it says, uh, that has that caveat. Play this ability only if an opponent controls more lands than you. So you pay one white and tap it, and you can search your library for any land card, reveal it, and put it into your hand. Um, but again, you need to be down on lands. So you want to play Weathered Wayfarer, and then on turn two, activate it, then play your land um, from your hand that you just drew. And the great thing about it is, is it can search up any land that you want. So you can look for that Cryptic Caves. You can look for that Nykthos. You can look for uh, some of these other utility lands that we're going to get. You don't have to just go and grab a basic planes. You can grab the correct land that you need at the given time and get it into your hand and into play. So again, more cards into your hand. It's pseudo card draw. It's pseudo ramp. It just makes sure that you get to where you need to be. The last one is land tax. So it's a one-man enchantment. During your upkeep, if an opponent controls more land than you, you may search your library and remove up to three basic land cards and put them into your hand and then shuffle. So <clears throat> you always, 
Uh, if you're behind, you're going to use your land tax, get your three planes. Um, word of advice on land tax. If you've never played with this card, always grab three. Does not matter. If you have land tax in play and you grab three lands and then your hand is going to be over the seven card limit at the end of your turn, doesn't matter. Just discard them. Discarding your lands or discarding anything else is going to be better because you're getting those lands out of your deck. Because if you have land tax online and you're perpetually behind on your lands in play, getting your lands out of your deck, which is going to mean that the cards that you draw are going to be more action cards and less dead land cards because land tax is getting you all the lands that you need. So just get them out of your deck. I mean, with land tax, you don't need that many lands. Maybe if you get up to 10 lands, you why would you need any more than that? Especially with all the ramp cards that we just showed you, all the artifact ramp. You can take all the other 10, 15 basic lands that you have in your deck and just throw them in your graveyard. Then more of your deck is actual gas and not crappy planes at that point. So always grab three. That's my advice. Anyway, so these are the three that require you to be behind on lands. So that's why you always want to play uh, not first. And then you can go grab those lands out of your deck, get them put into your hand, and you can always make your land drops with these guys. The next, we have a couple more ramp cards. I'm calling them ramp light. And in Smothering Tithe is one of them. It's a four mana enchantment. It doesn't really ramp you because once you're at four, you're not really in the ramp game as much anymore. Uh, but it does get you so much value. It says, whenever an opponent draws a card, that payer may pay two. If he doesn't, you get a treasure, which means you can uh, sacrifice it to add one mana of any color. So every time they draw a card, they have to make a decision. Do I want to pay two or do I want to let you have a treasure? Um, this can get out of hand very quickly. If you drop this early, nobody's going to want to pay the two because they're going to be one of developing their board. Um, I have gone... Um, I have played Avacyn on turn three with this deck because I have gone uh, Soul Ring into turn two uh, Smothering Tithe. Nobody paid the tax on Smothering Tithe, so I had three treasures into land drop number three. So I had three treasures plus Soul Ring plus three lands, and I cast Avacyn on turn three. So this card is pretty freaking busted. You can get your commander out super early, and then nobody can really interact with it. So it's 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 a very, very good card. The other one that we're playing is Oketra's Monument. It says, white creature spells you cast cost one less to cast. Okay, well, that makes Avacyn a seven drop commander instead of an eight. And whenever you cast a creature spell, create a one, one white warrior creature token with vigilance. So it just gives you incidental value on the board. Um, those little tokens can help when people try to do sacrifice effects. So you can just sacrifice the tokens off instead of one of your more valuable creatures. Um, it helps you cast your any of your creatures just one turn earlier or one mana less. So Ketra's Monument, while it's not ramp in traditional sense, most of the spells in the deck are either uh, are like creature spells, and they're all white, so you're always going to get that benefit from the Monument. And then you're going to get the uh, the extra the bodies to help you uh, win the game or just protect yourself a little bit better. So those are the two pseudo ramp cards that we have. They just reduce the cost on stuff or get you some stuff depending on what your opponents want to do. All right. Let's look at a couple of value creatures that we have in the deck. I've discussed it earlier, but we're playing Sun Titan. So it's a six mana, six, six with vigilance. Whenever it enters the battlefield or attacks, you may return target permanent card with converted mana cost three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. So if they found a way to deal with some of your permanents, Sun Titan will help you get them back onto the battlefield if they weren't um, exiled. Uh, if they were just destroyed before you had Avacyn out or they got rid of Avacyn and then destroyed stuff, then Sun Titan helps you recover from that. Um, or a silence, all of your, your hate bears and things like that, Sun Titan gets them back for you. Plus, he's not a bad beater at six mana for six. If Again, if they had ways to get rid of your stuff, we have Karmic Guide. It's a five mana, two, two, angel with flying and pro black. 
When it enters the battlefield, return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. So sometimes what you can do is you can... <laughs> these two play really well together because if they kill your Sun Titan, you can bring Karmic Guide back uh, to, to bring Sun Titan back. And then... Uh, you, now, Sun Titan's going to bring another thing back from the graveyard with it, too. So they just helps pull all of your stuff back out of the graveyard and get it get your game plan going again. One problem with Karma Guide is it does have an echo cost, uh, five or three and two white, so five mana is its, its same cost. Um, you, you have to pay that at your beginning of your next upkeep or you have to sacrifice it. But sometimes it doesn't necessarily matter if you have to sacrifice it or not. You you can maybe get it back with other methods or it did the it did what it needed to do the the first time got you that thing that you needed and a lot of times you'll have the five mana lying around because of all those ramp cards that we showed you before playing angel of serenity so it's a seven mana five six flyer when it enters the battlefield you may exile up to three other target creatures from the battle fan and or cards from graveyards and then when it leaves the battlefield, return the XL cards to their owner's hands. So if you do, if you have a bunch of stuff in your graveyard that you want, uh, creatures that is, you can exile your cards from your graveyard. And if they find a way to get rid of your Angel of Serenity, all those cards are going to come back to your hand. Or if there's a bunch of problematic creatures on the board that you need to get rid of, you can exile them with the Angel. And if you have Avacyn out, then it's going to start protecting the Angel from being killed. And then you just pretty much permanently got rid of those. Just It's flexible. It's either used on your own stuff in your graveyard to get it back later if you have a way, if they have a way to get rid of this. They never want to like kill it at that point because then you're just going to get a value. Or it's a good way to get rid of problematic things on the board if you think you're going to win uh, fairly soon after that. Um, and it's, again, taking things out of the graveyard, we're playing Emeria, the Sky Ruin. Um, it does enter the battlefield tap. It's a land. And it says at the beginning of your upkeep, if you control seven or more planes, you may return target creature guard from your graveyard to the battlefield. So you can go grab this with Weathered Wayfair early, put it on the battlefield, and then uh, start to accrue value later, late game once you have those seven planes in play and just start pulling stuff back out of your graveyard onto the battlefield. I've only ever seen this happen a couple times in games that I've played, but when it has worked, this card is a beater. It definitely is so much value for such little cost and investment into your deck. I mean, just having one land that comes in tapped that can potentially provide you with so much incidental value late game is really, really nice. Another card that we're playing is Helm of the Host. So this card is good on just about any of the creatures that we have. A lot of them have good effects that control the board or have some ETB effects that we'd like to copy. So when they come into the battlefield, we can get those again. Uh, but it's also ridiculous on Avacyn. Just creating another copy of her that they have to deal with is going to be hard because if they have a way to get rid of one, you still always have the other one. If they have a targeted removal spell like Swords to Plowshares or something like that that's super cheap, you have a second token copy that is you can just equip this onto again and just keep creating more and more of these big 8-8 angels that are just going to beat their face in. So very good card on this deck. And then the last one they're playing is uh, Resolute Archangel. Because you're going to draw so much hate when you play this deck, you need a way sometimes to bring your life total back up. Um, so this is a seven mana four, four angel. It says when it enters the battlefield, if your life total is less than your starting life total, it becomes equal to your starting life total. So if you're at 10 life or whatever, you're going to go back up to um, 40 life just off the, off the bat, just like that. And if you do this and it gets killed and later you're playing super late game with the Mario, you can bring it back and reset your life total back up to 40 again if you need to. So it's just a super helpful card. There's plenty of times when you're at a low enough life total because you've got enough chip damage over that Resolute Archangel is just super important to bring your life total back up. So that's all our utility, uh, not utility, but all of our value engine that we have here built into the deck as well. People don't think that things like this equate to card draw, but it does. When you're when you're playing the Sun Titan and you're grabbing something back out of your graveyard and putting it into play, it's not really card draw, but it's definitely card advantage because you've gotten 
two things for one, whereas somebody else was paying one. Same with Karmic Guide, same with Res- or, or Angel of Serenity, same with all these things, right? So they're, they're just providing you such incidental value that you don't necessarily always need a ton of cards in hand because the cards that you're playing in a white deck can get you that value that you need. All right, so we got a few more things to do. We got some targeted removal. We got a Swords to Plowshares. One mana, exile a creature. Its controller gains life equal to its power. Pretty much a commander staple. We got Path to Exile. These are the two, you know, super cheap, white, efficient removal cards. It says, remove target creature from the game. Its controller may search its library for a basic land and put it in the battlefield tapped. So these are early. If they have that combo piece or if they have something that you need to just get rid of, you can always just leave that one mana open and, and be able to have that. If we want to go for a bigger splash here play, we have Luminate Primordial. So it does the same thing as Swords to Plowshares. It's a 7 mana, 4-7 uh, with Vigilance. And when it enters the battlefield for each opponent, exile up to one target creature that player controls, and that player gains life equal to its power. So it just gets rid of three things on the board that are problematic and makes it so that you have a, a guy that you can attack in with as well. Um, we're playing Return to Dust. It's a four mana instant. It says exile target artifact or enchantment. If you cast this spell during your main phase, you may exile up to one more target artifact and enchantment. So if you need to get rid of, you know, like a dark steel forge or something like that, return to dust is definitely the card that you need. I mean, most of the other big uh, spells that we have for dealing with artifacts and enchantments destroy them, but return to dust exiles them. So it's, it's really good in a pinch when you have those indestructible enchantments and artifacts that you need to get rid of. And if you cast it during your main phase, you get two of them for the price of one. So pretty good little card's flexible. We're also playing Council's Judgment. It's a three-mana sorcery, and it says Will of the Council. So this is a keyword ability. It says starting with you, each player votes for a non-land permanent you don't control and exile each permanent with the most votes or tied for the most votes. So this is a very uh, cool card in Commander because it's you can try to convince people to get rid of the problematic things on the board. Or if each or if two different things get selected on the board, then it exiles two different things if 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 they're both shared for the most uh, votes. So if two people vote for one thing and two other people vote for something else, then they both get exiled. And they can't be yours. So it's just going to get rid of whatever's on the board that's causing a problem at that particular time. Council's judgment is going to be the way to get rid of it. And it can't be your thing. So that's that's very helpful. So these are all of our targeted removal spells. As you can see, they're all exile effects because all of our mass uh, effects are going to be destroying them. So we needed a way to get rid of some of the problems that we see that we can't just destroy. We're playing... Two counter spells, and we're playing white, so it's like, what? There's white counter spells? Yes, there are. Um, these will catch people so off guard that uh, most people don't ever see these coming. Uh, so we have Mana Tithe for one mana. It says counter target spell unless its controller pays one. So you can just, if they tap out for something huge, Mana Tithe will get them every time you can just hold it in your hand people will think you probably have path to exile or uh swords to plowshares or something if you're always leaving that one mana open but if they know you they know that you're going to have the mana tithe the other one that we're going to play is one that a lot of people don't really play but you should be playing in your white decks uh if you're playing a mono white deck is uh lapse of certainty it says counter target spell for three mana if that spell is countered this way put it on top of its owner's library instead of that player's graveyard so pretty much it's Counter your spell, put it back on top. But in a, if you're countering a counter spell and you're trying to do your big thing, say it's cast Avacyn and they go to counter it. If you last of certainty it, it goes back on top of their library. By the time they draw it again, it's not going to matter because you already have the item in play. So that counter spell is a dead card at that point. If they're going for a big... Um, a big spell that's going to win them the game right then, Last Uncertainty will put it back on their library and maybe the board can rally together to kill that player off or whatever instead of letting them cast that game-winning card again. Maybe they set up a bunch uh, prior to that happening and when you counter that last piece, 
uh, now if they go to cast it again, it's not going to be as good as it was the last time. Say they play like Mana Geyser and they get, you know, 40 mana and then they play, um, you know, a huge X spell. You just lapse certainty of the X spell and then the next turn when they only have, you know, six mana again, it doesn't matter. It's not going to be nearly as bad as when they had all that mana that first time. So this card is is actually pretty powerful. Um, it doesn't look like it on the surface, but in this kind of a deck, it really can uh, help you win the game. So those are our two counter spells. No one ever sees them coming. Then, since we make so much mana, you saw all those ramp cards that we played before. Sometimes you just need something to do with it late game. So we're playing a, uh, some mana sync type cards. One of the big ones is going to be Finale of Glory. So it's two, uh, it's white, white, X. And it says, create X, two, two soldier creature tokens with vigilance. If X is 10 or more, also create X, four, four white angel creature tokens with vigilance. So Avacyn costs eight. If you want to do the 10, it costs 12. Getting to 12 mana is not that hard to do in this deck. You can get there pretty consistently. Um, and this card is just a game winner because... 10 4 4s and 10 2 twos that are indestructible usually are just going to win the game. There's just nothing that they can really do against that. And then all of your stuff has Vigilance. This has Vigilance. All of these things have Vigilance. So you can attack with no problem. No one's going to hit you back because you have all these blockers in place too. So huge card for the end game when you have all that mana and nothing else to do with it. Another card that we're playing is Entreat the Angels. So it's a white, 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 and then double X says create X four four white angel creature tokens with flying, but it also has miracle. So it for two for white white X you can cast that card for its miracle cost if it's the first card you drew. So you can just dump out a bunch of angels late game if you draw this card as a miracle. If it happens to be in your hand, that's unfortunate. Maybe you know five angels or six angels or so is enough to win you the game at its normal cost. Um, but it, it gives you something to do with all that mana if you don't have anything else to do with it. Another card that we're playing is Heliod, God of the Sun, the original Heliod. He's indestructible, and as long as your devotion to white is uh, less than five, he isn't a creature. We're almost always going to have five devotion because all, all of our creatures have tons of white pips in them. It says other creatures you control have vigilance. So uh, with Avistin giving them indestructible, Helia giving them vigilance, you can just attack everybody and not worry about the crackbacks. And it's he has an activated ability of two and two white to put a 2-1 white cleric enchantment creature token onto the battlefield. So once you run out of things to do with all of your mana with Heliod, you can just keep pumping out some two-power dudes and uh, have some guys to attack around or block if you need to. And then the other card that we're playing is Castle Ardenvale, and it's a land, and it enters the battlefield tapped unless you control planes, which we are always going to do on by turn two when you're probably going to want to play this. And you can tap to add one white, and you can pay two and two white to tap to create a 1-1 one, one human creature token. It's not the most powerful ability, but it's free value on a land, so might as well do it. It helps you pump out some more guys that you can attack with or block with um, for very little cost to our deck. Finally, we have a couple of utility lands. Our big one is going to be Nykthos, Shrine to Nyx. It taps for one colorless. Or you can pay two and tap it and choose a color and add mana to your mana pool equal to your devotion to that color. So since all of our guys have so many white pips, you can tap this and sometimes for, you know, three lands, you know, two and then itself, you could sometimes net six, seven, eight mana off Nekthos, you know, easily casting your Avacyn on turn, on turn five or so. <clears throat> We have new Banalia, which is it enters the battlefield tapped. So we have a couple of cards that come in tapped, not very many. You don't want too many cards that come in tapped, but this one does. And it taps for a white mana, but when it enters the battlefield, you can scry one. So it's just a little bit of extra free value when you want it to help smooth out your draw a little bit. Um, you can really cut this, just play in other planes. It doesn't really matter. It's not that great of a card. It, it's not a huge game changer if you don't have that one. We're playing Idyllic Grange, which is technically a Plains, so this does work with your Ameria. Uh, 
So idyllic range enters the battlefield tapped unless you control three or more other planes. So you have to have four planes on the battlefield, which we usually are. And when it enters the battlefield, you just put a plus one, plus one counter on a creature. Uh, putting a counter on one of your smaller guys to get in for more chip damage is going to be just incrementally better. You just get, instead of having a 3-3 three, three flyer, now you have a 4-4 four, four flyer. That really makes kind of a, a bit of a difference when you're talking um, getting people down. And it's practically free to play. Um, if it comes in tapped, it comes in tapped. You don't need it. Um, if it doesn't, you just get a little bit of value on it. And then the last one we're playing is Windbrisk Heights. So it has hideaway, so you can look at the top four cards of your library, and you can put a card underneath of it, and then uh, you can cast that card later if you meet the hideaway clause. So it taps for a white, um, and if you pay white and tap, you can play the remove card if you attacked with three or more creatures this turn. So pretty easy to do in this deck when we have all the little tokens that we are creating from all the different sources and all the creatures that we have lying around from the early game. You can usually... Play the cre whatever card that you have on your Windbrisk Heights for one mana, and it could be a big Wrath that you could do like mid combat after you have Avacyn out. It could be, um, you know, whatever, just another big creature that you just got to pay one mana for. It's it's just really a, a great card. Like I said, there were other utility lands. Um, there's nine utility lands in total that um, we showed in some of the other categories because they fit into those these are just generically good um don't fit into any of the other categories and finally we are playing 25 basic planes so get your planes out um the, the deck only plays 34 lands total and that seems pretty low um for a commander deck most decks are playing uh lands but when you play Pretty much 18 ramp cards, you don't need that much land. And when you're playing cards like um, the, the, the land to hand cards, like uh, land tax and things like that, you're going to be pulling all these out and pretty much dumping them into your graveyard anyway. You, you don't need that many lands in your deck. Avacyn can come out very easily on some of those early returns without having too much. You might have to be somewhat aggressive with your mulliganing to make sure that you have a good combination of lands and ramp cards in order to get you to the desired outcome but that's that comes with playing the deck and learning how how to do it um you you just have to be more cognizant of what your end goal which is to get avacyn out as quickly as possible so if your hand doesn't do that maybe ship it back anyway so that's the deck uh, fun for me to play, like I said, not so fun for other people to play against because it pretty much shuts down all of their, all of their stuff that they want to do. Um, your meta may enjoy this deck or it may not, uh, up to you. I would forewarn people when you play it, like I said, um, it is fairly pricey. I think it's, I don't know, I'd have to go and check the stats on it again, but last I checked it was probably three or four hundred dollar deck uh for mono white but it, it it can definitely be worth the time if you're interested in a deck like this um so that's it i want to thank you all if you made it to the end here thanks for watching the video go ahead and uh, press like and keep uh watching the videos that the channel produces and we'll see you for the next deck tech